afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing today? My name is Dan. I'm the Jazz Shepherd, as I'm sure most of you at this point know. Um, welcome to my channel. Please subscribe if you haven't. Tell your friends who love jazz about it. Uh, we've been breaking down the history of jazz in the 50s, all the major labels and players, and discussing each different label's uh, vibe and what their driving forces were. Some of them were looking to make money. Some of them were looking to document an important history in American music. Uh, <clears throat> each label has its own flaws and its own strengths. Um, each label has eras where they had an incredible stable, it seems like, of musicians. Today we're going to talk about Emerson slash Mercury in the late 50s and uh, kind of wrap up season two and what happened in the 50s. Um, Emerson, Mercury, was a great Chicago label. They made their bread and butter in the early 50s with Clifford Brown and they had a lot of great singers like Sarah Vaughn and Dinah Washington. Uh, <clears throat> but there are a lot of great jazz artists as well. Uh, the Adderley Brothers, Jerry Mulligan, um, Clifford Brown, Max Roach. Uh, these guys all were staples of the label for a long time. Um, we're going to take a look at a few things here. Um, Donna Washington, from the very early days of Emerson Mercury, right into the 70s, she's making great records for this label. Uh, the stuff on Emerson is always going to be a little jazzier than the stuff you find on the Mercury imprint. Although by the time we get to the 60s, Emerson disappears and it just becomes Mercury. And, and there's no longer, obviously, Mercury puts out jazz titles at that point. But uh, I love pretty much everything Dime does, especially the stuff that was on Emerson in the 50s, late 50s. Sorry, uh, It's great stuff. Um, Sarah Vaughn. Has a lot of records as well on Emerson Mercury. Um, just a ton of stuff she put out. Some of it can be schmaltzier and poppier than others, but her range and her voice is pretty unrivaled. You know, uh, no one ever talks about Billie Holiday's great range. She was fairly limited, but Sarah Vaughan's range is fairly extensive, and her emoting and her um, just that trill in her voice, that emotional context. You know, it's not the sorrow of a Billie Holiday, but it certainly has its own character. And uh, Sarah's stuff is great. It's not that expensive generally. Always worth it when you find old Sarah on Emerson, especially. The other great singer that was going on at Emerson was Hel Helen Merrill. And her first three come out in the, in the mid 50s, and these she has a couple more that come out in the late 50s here. And I'm a big fan of Helen Merrill. Uh, <clears throat> just a really bluesy, heartfelt singer that you don't realize she's white till you look at her. You know, she sings with the pain and the sorrow of a sister. Um, she plays with Clifford. She plays with a lot of the greats at Emerson on a lot of great jazz sessions. She's not by any way, by any way, just a commercial white artist that they were looking to sell to white people. This was a jazz singer and she was really kind of unheralded until you get really deep into jazz. You don't really even hear of her. You know, you hear of the Ella Fitzgeralds and the Billie Holidays and even the Sarah Vaughns and the Dinah Washingtons. Helen Merrill is kind of a name you don't really hear enough. And I can't tell you enough how good her records are. And if you look them up, you'll see how expensive they are. They've really, the early ones especially, go for top, top dollar. Clifford Brown, of course, passed away in 1956, but they're still finding stuff to put out from the Clifford Brown All-Stars. Uh, boy, what a band. Max Roach, Rollins was a member of the group at times. Uh, another great player who makes a number of records at Emerson is Jerry Mulligan, the great baritone player. And Mulligan's a guy that's kind of hard to define. He can make a cool record one moment, make a hot record the next moment, make a hard bop record the next moment, and then do something that's uh, on the edge of the avant. You know, he's a pretty interesting player. Uh, played with everyone for decades. He's around. Gotta love Mulligan. The stuff's always very affordable. Now the great Max Roach, after Clifford Brown dies, he starts to become a very important figure 
in the, at Emerson Mercury. He does a lot of recordings. Um, he brings in guys like Booker Little. Of course, Rollins plays them at times. Uh, he's just a fantastic drummer, one of the, some of the greatest chops in jazz. And he was a great leader and innovator, and he also had a really strong social consciousness. And so a lot of his stuff is laced with uh, protest and uh, time for change. <clears throat> and he certainly wasn't allowed a lot of liberty at Emerson Mercury to express that stuff. That's why you see some of that stuff like Freedom Now We Insist on Candid. Because he needed to have an avenue to, do, to go down and express some of the things he had to say. But Max was an important guy and he did a lot of leading in the jazz in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, another guy who did a lot of records at Columbia, uh, Emerson, sorry, was Cannonball Adderley. And uh, Cannonball, his Emerson stuff probably isn't on par with what he does at Riverside. But great cover. I'm a big Cannonball guy. I think him and Nat are one of the great sets of brothers in jazz. They play a lot of each other's records and I don't think you can ever go wrong with the Cannonball early session. Um, now, in 1960, in 1960, Emerson goes away and it becomes just uh, the Mercury label and uh, a very important guy on the Mercury label was Quincy Jones. And I'm going to show you his a lot of his stuff here that comes out in the late 50s. First on Embassy, and then we switch over to Mercury. And uh, he was recognized very early as a new innovative voice in jazz. And you see guys who've been in the business for a long time doing his arrangements and uh, seeking him out. And Mercury probably recognized what they had with him. And so they give him a lot of different stuff from doing Mancini to doing kind of world music. He's really all over the map. Does some movie soundtrack stuff, of course. A lot of it actually. Uh, Quincy was undoubtedly one of the great arrangers in jazz. And he's probably, after Mingus and Ellington, one of the great composers and arrangers in the history of the music. Uh, and he's still doing it today. And people kind of recognize him and know him more for the Michael Jackson Brothers Johnson, Chuck and Con era stuff, where he was doing that disco funk better than anybody. You know, the Brothers Johnson song, Stomp. That's one of the greatest party songs I've ever heard. Uh, but Quincy is an important figure in the history of American music, not just in jazz. And he's still doing his thing. But his early stuff on Emerson and Mercury, he has one on ABC as well. Uh, it's pretty brilliant stuff for a young guy. He's really utilizing a lot of the great players around Chicago and New York. He's bringing a lot of what Mingus and Ellington brought to the table, but he's adding different tempos and rhythms and really spicing up a lot of stuff that's happening in pop music. When Quincy does a version of something, it's always worth hearing. Uh, his records aren't that expensive. You can find those old Embassy Mercury records for 10, 20 bucks, usually sometimes 30. If it's a nice old pressing, but they're always worth having. <clears throat> so Mercury starts to go away from jazz by the time the 60s come around and the 70s. Mercury was releasing all kinds of different stuff, and they still sprinkle in some great titles, like We Free Kings. That's a great record, you know. But uh, <clears throat> Mercury definitely doesn't stay with jazz too much longer. It becomes very much a side note to what the history of that label. But they started firmly rooted in the jazz idiom. And so they, they're an important part of the jazz history of that era. And people need to give them a lot of respect. And when you see old Emerson's and old Mercury's, grab them. They're great records. Um, I think this kind of wraps up season two, actually, because I covered a lot of the labels all the way through the 50s and their first go around. Stuff like the, the LA label, I just did all the late 50s right away. So we're gonna go to jump to season three next, and we're gonna start talking about what happens in 1960 going forward at Blue Note and Prestige and Riverside. And then we're gonna see Impulse come on the scene, how they kind of change things as well, and how their moment is there for a couple, three years. But um, jazz is starting to change very rapidly now. I appreciate you all for following. I appreciate you all for watching. My name is Dan the Jazz Shepherd. Remember to subscribe to my channel. 
stay tuned because very soon I'm going to start season three, Blue Note, 1960. And that's going to be an episode worth watching because we know what Blue Note's doing pretty much from 55 through 65. It's unrivaled. Appreciate you all. Have a good night. Peace.